Hi class, today we will be talking about population and reproductive health. The outline for the PowerPoint is population dynamics, history of population growth, consequences of population increases, and reproductive health and the social determinants of health. What are the principal determinants of health worldwide? They are the three P's, population, poverty, and pollution. I like this quote by Vlahov, reconciling the growing proportion of the global population that lives in urban centers with the goal of creating healthy cities for all poses the major public health challenge of the 21st century. Throughout this course, we will be integrating the three P's throughout the lectures and the role they play on health. Population Dynamics this refers to the ever-changing interrelationships among the set of variables that influence the demographic makeup of populations, as well as the variables that influence the growth and decline of population sizes. What are these variables? They are fertility, death rates, and migration. Fertility. A measure of fertility is a total fertility rate which indicates how many births a woman would have by the end of her reproductive life. In the U.S., the fertility rate stabilized in 2012 to 1.9 births per woman. The natural population replacement rate is estimated to be 2.1. Some of the fertility trends we are seeing in the world today is that some areas of the world are at or below the replacement rate for fertility. Actually, Russia and some Eastern European countries are losing population. Other countries that fall into at or below the replacement rate for fertility are the U.S., Canada, Japan, and China. However, many African countries have a fertility rate of 4.0 births per woman. The other variable in population dynamics is death rates. And the good news is mortality has declined markedly in the world, except for the countries in Africa hardest hit by AIDS. Why have we seen this life expectancy increase? Mainly, it is due to improved infant and child survival. And migration? Well, we are seeing some of the most recent transfers of migrants from Asia and Latin America to North America. We've also seen migration from countries of Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, which suffered through uh, the early 90s and uh, the change from communism to basically chaos. I was there during the early 90s when this was occurring. And a lot of migrants moved to the U.S. and other countries from Russia, and census estimates indicate by 2050 a lot of the population growth we'll see in the U.S. will be due to migration, about 33 percent. The stages of the demographic transition we have already discussed in Module 1. I'm not going to go over these stages again except to say that the research has shown that this process is quite varied and does not occur consistently across countries. Now we'll talk about the history of population growth. I find this fascinating. Since in 1800, world population reached 1 billion. By 1900, it was 1 1.6 billion. By 1960, 3 billion, and by 2000, the population reached 6 billion. The population doubled in 40 years. I think our descendants will look back on the late 1960s peak as the most significant demographic event in the history of the human population. And here's a graph which shows the steep rise in population growth in the 20th century. Also, 
By 2050, it's poor countries that will have six times the population of rich countries. It's estimated around 7.9 billion compared to 1.2 billion. And since 2000, we are also seeing that old people are outnumbering young. In 2050, nearly one person in three in developed countries will be 60 years or older, and one in five in less developed countries. And since 2007, we have seen that urban people outnumber rural. And within the next 30 years, nearly two-thirds of the world's population will live in urban areas. I also found it striking when I was reading about China's rural population moving to urban areas. This is actually the largest migration movement in world's history. Almost half of all Chinese live in urban areas today. And there are a staggering 90 cities in China with a population of more than 1 million people. So why are we discussing population? Because there are some consequences as a result of these rapid population increases. And they include urbanization, the carrying capacity exceeded, food insecurity, and loss of biodiversity. Urbanization, as we discussed previously, it's expected to reach about 66% by 2030. Factors that lead to urbanization include industrialization, food availability, employment opportunities, lifestyle considerations, and escape from political conflict. And there are hazards of the urban environment. These include biological pathogens or pollutants, including the pathogenic agents and their vectors and reservoirs. There are chemical pollutants including those added to the environment by human activities, such as industrial waste. There's reduced availability, increased cost, and lowered quality of natural resources on which human health depends, for instance, food, water, and fuel. There are physical hazards. An example is a high risk of flooding in houses and settlements built on floodplains. And the built environment can affect the physical or psychosocial health. Examples are overcrowding, inadequate protection against noise, inadequate provision of infrastructure, services, and common areas, and increase in crime. And with the built environment and people becoming more sedentary in urban areas, there's an increase in obesity. There's also natural resource degradation. And finally, national global environmental degradation with more indirect but long-term influences on human health. I just wanted to point out that even though we're talking about population increases and urbanization, there are many, many rural health disparities. And Merson cites many of these disparities. For example, access to reproductive health services and to, to clean drinking water are only two examples. In 2011, only 53% of deliveries in rural areas were attended by skilled health personnel versus 84% of them in urban areas. And 83% of the population without access to an improved drinking water source live in rural communities. Now these facts were taken from the Millennium Development Goals Report 2013, which I've also listed in this uh, syllabus. It's an excellent resource. The carrying capacity exceeded another consequence of population increases. And the carrying capacity is the population that an area will support without undergoing environmental deterioration. I like this quote by the famous Harvard University biologist, E.O. Wilson, and he points out that we are about to pass through the bottleneck, a period of maximum stress on natural resources and human ingenuity. 
And with the carrying capacity, we also have a population crash. What is a population crash? This is when animal populations experience where their growth exceeds carrying capacity. And usually, food availability, reproductive behavior, and infectious diseases tend to keep animal populations in check. Along with carrying capacity, we have the global warming, too, which is a, a, a serious factor. And we see that these C CO2 emissions are very troubling. Carbon dioxide is now expelled three times as fast as oceans and land can absorb it. World forests and fisheries are dwindling. Actually, half the world's original forest cover is gone, and another 30% is degraded or fragmented. In the past 50 years, we've seen that industrial fleets have fished out at least 90% of all, lo all large ocean predators, such as tuna, cod, and flounder. And more and more species are becoming endangered because of environmental degradation. Another consequence is with this carrying capacity, we can have the food insecurity. Um, and by the year 2050, will the world's farmers be able to feed 9 billion people? This is 3 billion more than we are feeding today or attempting to feed today. And again, we also see, I just want to point again, out again that this loss of biodiversity and the danger to food production as a result of the growth in these invasive species and the eradication of helpful plants and insects, such as the bee. The last part of this lecture will be on the elements of reproductive health. And most of this is taken from your text. What are the elements of reproductive health? They are that every sex act should be free of coercion and infection. Every pregnancy should be intended. Every birth should be healthy for both mother and child. And the eight MDGs established in 2000 include maternal health goals. We have seen some successes as far as population and reproductive health. For example, the total fertility rate has dropped throughout the world. From 1950 to 2000, the total fertility rate for the world declined from 5.02 to 2.65. And in Africa, the total fertility rate has also dropped from 6.72 in 1950 to 4.97 in 2000. And a lot of this is due to the family planning programs that have been implemented throughout the world directly intended to reduce fertility. And many of these family planning programs in low and middle income countries have significantly increased the prevalence of contraceptive use and have played this important role in the reduction of fertility. But we'll see in a later slide that there's very much an unmet need regarding contraceptive use. And we have failures. Your assignment for this week will be discussing Millennium Development Goal number five. And do you think we'll get to the goal of reducing by 75% the maternal mortality ratio by 2015? Now, in 2012, MDG number five showed the least progress of all the MDGs. The maternal mortality ratio is still very high in all developing countries, especially Sub Saharan Africa. Look at this contrast. 475 per 100,000 live births is the MMR in Sub-Saharan Africa compared to the U.S. where it's 21 per 100,000. And as we've seen before, most of this population we see is occurring in the poorest countries. 35 of the world's poorest countries have the highest birth rates. And more than one-third of the 205 million pregnancies which occur annually throughout the world are unintended. That's one out of three are unintended. And in the developing world, an estimated 
222 million women have an unmet need for contraception. What are the consequences of these unintended pregnancies and births? One is abortion, about 20% of all pregnancies. The access to safe abortion is highly variable, even when legal. There's an estimated 66,500 maternal deaths a year due to unsafe abortion. There's an impact on the male-to-female sex ratio. Unwanted births have higher mortality. And it has cu human capital effects, especially on girls and women. What are some of the causes of maternal mortality and morbidity? Well, this is what you will be discussing in your assignment. I would like to emphasize that there are direct causes, which occur only during pregnancy, and there are indirect causes, and these are conditions aggravated by pregnancy. What are the direct causes of pregnancy-related mortality? Well, in order of importance, they are hemorrhage, sepsis, hypertensive disorders, complications of unsafe abortion, and obstructed and prolonged labor. In low and middle income countries, these direct causes account for 75 to 80 percent of maternal mortality. The indirect causes are illnesses aggravated by pregnancy, and they are anemia, hepatitis, TB, malaria, STIs. And the Lancet article for this week discusses the maternal maternal mortality ratio, and how AIDS has had a significant impact on the MMR. In this case, the indirect causes attribute about 20 to 25 percent of the maternal deaths. They contribute to about 20 to 25 percent. I'd also like to add that approximately 50% of pregnant women around the world are anemic. What are some mechanisms to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity? One, reduce the total number of pregnancies. Two, improve access to safe abortion. And three, this is critical, obstetric care. Provide a package of basic services. Treat the infections, IV drugs, facilities to treat emergencies. Remove the placenta and or retain products of conception, assisted vaginal delivery, and C-section access if necessary, as well as blood transfusions. The majority of maternal and perinatal mortality and morbidity stems from complica complications of the delivery process. And again, I'd like to point out that there are successes. Sri Lanka has significantly reduced its MMR by better obstetric care and increase in births attended by trained personnel. This is discussed on page 111 in Merson. What are the elements of obstetric care? They are identify the serious medical complications in a timely fashion. And when I discuss this, I'd like to emphasize that besides educating the mothers, it's so critical to educate other family members, including the husbands. Research has shown that if you exclude men from most prenatal care and family planning programs, that this has affected the ability of women to take advantage of their services because men play a dominant role in family planning decisions in many reg regions. Second, we need to identify the constraints affecting obstetric care services. These constraints can include lack of transportation. Rural mothers are especially affected, lack of financial resources. And three, improve the quality of care at the obstetric facility. This means we need birth attendants who are trained appropriately. We need resources, equipment, and supplies. And there needs to be a clear chain of referral where the trained birth attendants 
are able to refer the complicated obstetric ca case to the higher level facility. So they can then take advantage of hopefully where specialist care is available. In sum, the high-risk pregnancies are first-time mothers, mothers with five or more pregnancies, very young and older mothers, women already in poor health, and pregnancies terminated by unsafe abortions. This is an excellent uh, YouTube video that I have assigned for this week. And it's looking at Lesotho and Partners in Health, which has been critical in helping to reduce um, the maternal mortality ratio. And what are some of the strategies they are using? First, when you look at prenatal care, now they are making sure women are receiving prenatal care beginning in the first trimester. And 600 trained maternal health workers now accompany women to four prenatal visits. Transportation. I like this contrast between the transportation in the U.S., about 20 minutes during the typical pregnancy and childbirth experience, where in Lesotho it can be up to five hours on foot. So what has Lesotho done with partners in health? They now have lying in houses where 72 women can stay at six waiting houses. And this is near the clinic, and it's weeks before labor begins. Finally, childbirth with skilled attendants. In the U.S., this occurs all the time, but in Lesotho, only for about 58% of the births. There has now been a 300% increase in deliveries with skilled attendants at one Partners in Health clinic in just one year. And as you can see, the outcome so far recorded zero deaths among the participating women and delivered almost 1,400 babies. Uh, just a little bit about Partners in Health. You may have already heard of Paul Farmer. He's famous for his humanitarian work providing first world health care for third world people. And he began in Haiti and he was made famous in the award-winning Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder, a book I highly recommend. I love this quote because Partners in Health is not just, just a health organization, but a social justice organization. And one of the other founders of Partners in Health, Ophelia Dahl, says, we believe that love and imagination are potent weapons in the fight for the poor. And I'd also like to add that besides, you know, these direct and indirect causes, there are underlying factors that are part of the whole landscape or when we look at the women's health status. We need to really address the health inequities or the, the gender inequities that women face. We talked about poverty and its impact on health, but also gender inequity has an impact on health. And like we said, the the husband might control the, the decisions made in the home as far as contraceptive use and prenatal care. And this gender inequity is is limited access to education, legal systems that fail to protect women, and gender-based violence. So we really need to address MDG number three to reach MDG number five. And MDG number three is to promote gender equality and empower women. We have seen so many studies where women who are provided education, there is great, great outcomes in improved health. And as far as the social determinants of health, you know, I talked about gender inequity or 
a general cultural factor. And this is a great diagram that's in Merson in Chapter 3. But it shows that overarching level of the general socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions are greatly, greatly influencing health. A lot of times we started with health education and we emphasized individual lifestyle factors, such as age or sex or, you know, someone's choice to smoke. Now, there's also, as you can see with this diagram, the social and community networks. So now there's a lot of research as far as peer support or how the community or trust in the community can impact health. And then, like I said, this overarching level is, is very, very important. And they give some examples of, you know, just living and working conditions that can influence health. And some of these social determinants of health are unemployment or water and sanitation, housing, the work environment, education, agriculture and food production. And since I live in New Orleans, I wanted to just show you this fascinating map which shows that there are short distances to large disparities in health even at the city level. And this is a, a report by the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. And it analyzes public health across a wide range of measures, including the social determinants of health, such as violent crime, and maps the results by zip code. And New Orleans, as you can see here, you have great, great differences in life expectancies. In one region, Lakeview, which is a very uh, upper white neighborhood, it's 80 years. But then if you look down uh, closer to the French Quarter, you can see that around the Iberville area, it's 55 years. And the report notes that there's a close correlation between health trends and the level of a neighborhood's racial homogeneity. In heavily black neighborhoods, residents are more prone to dropping out of school and having difficulty finding employment. This can lead to health troubles down the road, including debilitating stress that in turn increases the risk of heart disease and stroke in later life. And there are now studies showing that blacks can experience this stress based on racial inequities, and this can impact on chronic diseases. And these are some of the racial disparities in Louisiana. And as you can see, Louisiana, well, first I should say Louisiana and Mississippi are always competing as far as um, being the worst off as far as health and other quality of life issues. And I, I put this table together, which shows the great r racial disparities in Louisiana. You can see the poverty rate, whites, 17%, blacks 45%, and Hispanics 40%. Education, or males with no high school diploma, whites 2.5%, blacks 17.7%, and Hispanics 12%. And then the incarceration rate, just, uh, pff, just huge differences. And actually, Louisiana has the highest incarceration rate in the world. I wanted to just show you, too, that since we're talking about reproductive health, some of the differences as far as um, the infant mortality rate. Notice it's 6.6 .6 for whites and 13.9 for blacks. I also found that there's a great difference between uh, preterm births and, and low birth rates, with blacks having the, the worst statistics. And then again, since I am a evaluator for the Department of Public Health, their HIV STD prevention program, I've also focused on looking at racial disparities as far as HIV AIDS. And the Lancet article assigned this week explains 
how AIDS can also have an impact on the maternal mortality ratio. Louisiana ranked fourth highest in AIDS case rates and 11th in the number of AIDS cases diagnosed in the nation. Baton Rouge ranked first and New Orleans fifth in AIDS case rates for metropolitan statistical areas. And blacks account for only 32% of Louisiana's population, yet 67% of people living with HIV are black. The AIDS diagnosis rate for blacks is more than eight times higher than for whites. And the HIV diagnosis rate for blacks is more than seven times higher than whites. And um, STDs, unfortunately, Louisiana is doing very poorly in this area. I have my work cut out for me. Louisiana ranked first for syphilis, first for gonorrhea, and third highest for chlamydia cases. And again, blacks accounted for 90% of syphilis cases and the vast majority of the gonorrhea and chlamydia cases. And I'm going to leave... Uh, you with this great table, which look, again focuses on the social determinants of health, and I, I think this is important to keep in mind throughout this course and the various lectures you'll hear. Um, I like how they map out these social determinants. Place of residence, rural and urban, we have discussed that. Ethnicity or race, we have discussed that today. And then some of these others, um, you, you will Again, these will be introduced throughout the course. And I hope you have enjoyed this lecture and have a great day.